Hello and welcome back to Solomon's Cave. Imagine this. You are an ancient Greek philosopher, wrestling with the philosophy of Parmenides and the paradoxes of Zeno. You develop a brilliant new theory to solve the problems that they have raised. It is complex, nuanced, elegant, and so you found a school and start teaching it. You attract some brilliant students who are enthusiastically adopting your new theory and one of them even begins to write about it. But then this bright young student starts to write a lot more about it, expanding and improving upon your theory, and he continues on long after you are dead. Until just a few generations after your death, one of the students of your students of your students openly says that you never existed and it was all your students' idea. Something like that seems to have happened to Lucipus. Or Leucippus? I'm just gonna say Leucippus and his much, much more famous pupil, Democritus, who were together responsible for the famous theory of atomism. In this video, we'll look at Leucippus, his life and the inspiration for atomism, while in the next video, we'll explore Democritus and unpack atomism even more. Since the very existence of Leucippus was in doubt for a long time, it should not surprise us that we know very little about his life. Starting with where he was born and ending with when he died, we largely depend on guesses. As for where he was born and grew up, three places are often mentioned, namely Miletus, Elea and Abdera. Traditions possibly inspired by the fact that his philosophy closely resembled that of the Milesians, that he tried to answer the Iliadics and that his theory was practiced by his students in Abdera. Also, when he was born and died is very uncertain. Some put a very broad date of 5th century BC, others say he lived around 435 BC. So let's be generous and say that he lived from 480 to 420 BC, which, as you can see, comes very close to Socrates. Now mind you, this doesn't mean that we are running out of pre-Socratics anytime soon. There are plenty of those left. But it does mean that the term pre-Socratic from here on out is more of a vibe than a date on the calendar. Also, keep in mind that Socrates' philosophy only became prominent and popular in ancient Greece after Plato started publishing his dialogues. The names of two books of Lucippus have been preserved. One book was called Megas Diakosmos, The Great World System, and the other was called On Nature. Nah, I'm messing with you. The title of the second book was Peri Nu, On Mind. Oh, and this is interesting, especially if you remember that Anaxagoras thought that the mind was responsible for creating the world by stirring a soup of seeds. Could Lucippus have written about a similar idea? In any case, Lucippus was struggling with the same question Thales and the other Milesians were trying to answer. What is the stuff that everything was made of? What is the arche? At the same time, he also tried to answer the challenges put forth by Parmenides, which was sharpened by Zeno and Melissus, that asked the question, how is motion possible? Let me briefly summarize two of Zeno's challenges, which he gave in the form of paradoxes. The first one is about proving that all things are one, or that there is only one thing. There are not two or more things, because that's impossible. Imagine this, two things are standing next to each other. But now, what is in between those two things? Is there nothing in between them? Or is there something in between them? If you say nothing, well then, well then you could actually say that they are just one thing. If you say that there is something in between them, then now we have three things instead of two. But what is between objects one and three, or between two and three? Something or nothing. Each time it cannot be nothing, so then there is always something which means that there is only one thing. The second one is the fact that he believed that motion was impossible. Because if, say, an arrow is flying through the air, 
At one moment it is in a certain place, and it isn't at another place. But now, if you believe in motion, you believe that the next moment it isn't in the place where it is, and it is in the place where it isn't. So the place where the arrow is now becomes nothing, and the place where the arrow isn't suddenly becomes arrow. That is also impossible. Similarly, Melissus used logic rather than paradoxes to argue against the existence of nothingness or the void. Nor is there any void, for the void is nothing, and what is nothing would not be. Nor does what is move, for it does not have anywhere to withdraw to, since it is all full. Now, if there were void, what is would withdraw into the void, but since there is no void, it does not have any place to withdraw to. In short, since nothing does not exist, all is one, and since all is one, motion cannot exist. In comes Lucifer, who draws the opposite conclusion. Since there is motion, all things cannot be one. And since all things cannot be one, nothingness, or the void, has to exist. On the other end, Zeno also argued with his famous paradox of Achilles and the turtle, that since reality can be divided indefinitely, Achilles can never actually win the race, because each time Achilles covers the distance to where the turtle is now, the turtle will have moved just the tiniest bit farther. And since you can divide space infinitely, the turtle can move an infinite distance before Achilles has caught up. By the way, see my video on Zeno to see these paradoxes explained in full, if this went a little too quickly for you. In any case, here too Lucippus reversed the logic. Since we see fast runners like Achilles overtake turtles who have a half-track head start, clearly reality cannot be divided infinitely. At some point you reach an undividable unit, an atomos unit, an atom. And that's it. Those are the two core premises with which Lucifer started his atomic theory. Being and not being. Matter and void. Matter is made up of indivisible little units, atoms, and between them is the void. This way we can finally solve Zeno's paradoxes. But now that we have atoms and the void, how come there is so much diversity in the world? Remember, this was one of the many questions which was central to the Milesian search for the Arche, explaining diversity. Lucifer's answer was that atoms can come in many different shapes and sizes, and that if they combine in particular ways, they can form compounds that have unique properties. Besides, there are an indefinite number of types of atoms because, well, why not? Also, all these atoms are in a constant state of motion, or vibration if you will. Hmm, a constant state of motion, constantly changing their positions and combinations. That sounds a lot like Heraclitus. But, the atoms themselves, they are eternal and unchanging. One atom has a given size and shape, and that can never change. Hmm... Unchanging and unchangeable eternal matter. That sounds a lot like Parmenides. Then the world or the cosmos. How does atomism explain that? All atoms, or a bunch of them anyway, were together in one place. And then there was a swirl or a vortex. The larger atoms clumped together and formed the earth, while the smaller ones were spun outwards and formed the heavenly bodies. As for the shape of the earth, it appears that he agreed with some of the earlier Milesians that the earth was flat or perhaps drum-shaped, but also tilted towards the south. This tilt explained why it was colder in the north 
and warmer in the south. And finally, since the void stretched out infinitely, and since there was an infinite number of atoms, he seems very open to the idea that there were multiple worlds. Infinitely many worlds, in fact. For there is no reason there wouldn't be vortices elsewhere as well, forming other Earths. Yet another idea he shared with the Malaysian philosophers, specifically Anaximander. Now there is one more thing I want to mention, because only one quote of him survives, and it is from the book On Mind, and it goes like this. Nothing happens at random, but everything for a reason and by necessity. Oh, that's interesting. For remember when Anaxagoras was talking about mind or nous? We were tempted to think of this mind at the beginning of time that set everything in motion as though it were God. But then it turned out that this mind was actually not a conscious being at all, but just a blind force of nature. It seems that Lucifer agreed with this notion. The world is governed by natural laws, and there is no opportunity for randomness, indeterminism, or even, it seems, free will. The most common objection to any philosophy or theology that does not allow for a free will is of course that of morality. How can any act be moral or immoral if our actions are predetermined by the blind forces of nature? or, in some theological systems, by God. Whether or not Lucifer responded to that familiar objection or not, we don't know. But we will for sure see Democritus' response to this, along with a more detailed look at atomism in the next video.